New chapter functions. Let's imagine that in your program you will frequently convert numbers from decimal to binary. Imagine that each time you wanted to do the task, you would have to write the necessary code for it. It would be really annoying and your code would be unnecessarily long. So to avoid this problem, there exists in programming a solution, a kind of magic tool, a machine that would perform that task every time that you need to. It's called a function. And the function is just a block of instructions that perform a task when you call it. So to take our last example, we can have a function that converts a number from decimal to binary. And we would call it in our program each time we want to convert a number from decimal to binary. For example here we called the function three times. Functions have many uses. As we said earlier, it avoids rewriting the same instructions each time. And also, the fact that we can reuse them as many times as we need in our program. And most importantly, it gives us the possibility to divide our code into small functions instead of having a big single amount of code. So, it improves readability, understandability, and maintainability of the code. Now let's see what you need to know to use functions in the next video. See you there. Welcome to this video where we will learn what are the properties of a function and how to create one. First we have the return type. What is the return type? You have to know that a function can return an output. For example, if you make a function to calculate the square of a number, the square will be the result so the function will return that square. So we have to precise the data type of that result. For example, int or char or something like that. But we can decide to not return anything. For example, if you make a function that prints hello world, it won't return anything. You aren't waiting for a result from it. So we have to use the keyword void. We will see that in the syntax. Then you have the function name. Same as variables, each function needs its own name and that's obvious. And the function naming follows the same rules as variables. Then you have an important part, the parameters, also called the arguments. What are the parameters? The parameters are some data that the function can use to perform its task. For example, if we want to make a function that calculates the square of a number, we will have to give that number to the function so that it will be able to calculate its square. If we compare it to a cook chief, parameters are like the ingredients we give to the cook chief so that he can cook by using them. Then we have the instructions that the function will execute to do its task. And then we have eventually the return statement. If the function returns something, we must have a return statement. But if the function returns nothing, the return statement is not obliged. When the return statement is executed, the function directly ends even if there is instructions after the return statement. Now let's see the syntax. So the syntax of a function in C language starts with the return data type. The data type of what your function will return. If it will return an int, here we write int. If it will return a float, here we write float, and so on. And as we said, if it returns nothing, we write void. Then we have the function name. And now, we put parameters between parentheses. Parameters must be separated by a comma. And for each parameter, we must precise its data type and its name. We can have any number of parameters we want. We can also choose to use zero parameters. In this case, we just let empty parentheses here. And after it, we have the body of the function. We open curly brackets, and inside we put the instructions that will be executed when we call the function. Finally, we can have the return statement. In functions that return something, we must have a return statement. We write return, then the value that we want to return. Note that a function can return only one value. And as said earlier, if the return statement is executed, the function ends directly and returns that result and the program moves to the code that comes after the function call. We can also use the return statement in a void function when we want to end it, but we just write return without any value after it. We will see all that in examples. Last thing in this video, we will talk about the position of a function in the program. First thing you have to know that each C program contains at least one function, which is the main function. The program wouldn't run without it. Second thing, note that we can't create a function inside a function. So for example, if we have the main function and we want to create another one, it must be outside. Last thing, you have two choices when creating a function. You can choose to put it before the main function in the program like this, 
or if you want to put it after the main function, you have to declare it before the main by using a prototype. The prototype contains the return type, the function name, and the parameters, and a semicolon at the end. Don't forget the semicolon. So if we want to put a function after the main, we have to put its prototype before the main, then we have the main, then we have the full function definition after it. Now let's move to the next video to talk about the pass by value and the pass by reference. See you there. Welcome to this video where we will talk about the pass by value and pass by reference, two important things that you need to understand about parameters. You have to know that when passing a parameter to a function, we have two ways to do it. We can pass it by value, it means that the program will create a copy of that parameter in another address location that will be deleted when the function ends. It implies that modifying the value of that parameter won't modify the original value. We use the pass by value when we don't want to modify the original value. Let's see an example. Let's create a simple function that increments the pass parameter. We have void because the function returns nothing. The name and a number as a parameter. And inside we write number plus plus to increment the parameter. Now let's call it from the main function. If we print the value of the variable after calling the function and we compile, you can see that it didn't change, because we passed the parameter by value, so it didn't modify the original one. And the second way to pass our parameters is pass by reference. This time we won't create a copy, we will directly pass the address of the variable. It implies that if we modify the value of the parameter, the original value will also be modified, because they are in the same memory location. And for that, the parameter has to be a pointer. A pointer is a variable that holds the address of another variable. So we have to add this asterisk. We will talk more about pointers in another chapter. And in calling the function, we have to add this ampersand before the variable, because we want to pass its address. Remember, we did the same thing for scanf. Let's take again the function we made which increments the value of the parameter. The parameter becomes a pointer. Same thing inside. So now if we call it from the main function by passing the address of the variable, if we compile, you can see that the value got modified. It was 5 and after the function call it became 6. So the original value changed. In the next video we will make a lot of functions to understand better how to use them. Before ending this video, I want to show you this GIF that I found on mathwarehouse.com that shows the difference between pass by value and pass by reference. We have here a cup of coffee and a function that fills it. At right it represents the pass by value. You can see that the parameter is a copy of the cup, so when it's filled, the original one isn't modified. But at left, we have the pass by reference. We gave the address of the cup to the function. This is why it got filled after calling the function. See you in the next video to create some functions. Too much theory, let's create some functions. Try to create each function we're gonna do before watching the solution. First function, a function that returns the square of a float number. So the result will be of type float. Let's name it square. And in parameters, we only need the number that we're gonna square. We won't modify it so it's passing by value. And inside the function, we just directly return the number multiplied by itself. And we get the square. If we call this function in the main to calculate the square of 4.5 and 8, and we compile, we get 20.25 and 64 respectively. Next function, let's create a function that calculates the sum of two integers a and b. The function will return an integer, let's call it sum. In parameters we need two integers a and b, and inside we just return the sum a plus b, and we got our function. If we try it with 10 and 5, you can see that while calling the function, we respect the number of parameters required. Here we needed two, so we passed two parameters a and b, not less and not more. And by the way, we could directly write 10 and 5 without using variables. When we compile this program, we get 15. Third function, let's make a function that prints the multiplication table of an integer from 1 to 10. It returns nothing, so it's void type. Let's name it multiplication table. In parameters, we need an integer that we can name number, and inside first we print that it's a multiplication table, then we need a for loop where i goes from 1 to 10. And inside we print number multiplied by i is equal to number times i. 
If we call our function with the number 8, for example, we get the multiplication table of 8. Function number 4, let's make a boolean function that verifies if a character is vowel or not. The function returns true or false, so it returns boolean type. To use boolean type, we said that we need to include a cdbool point h. And now, function is of type bool, let's name it is vowel. In parameters, we need the character that we're gonna verify, let's name it ch. And inside the function, we return this boolean expression where we compare the character with all the lowercase and uppercase vowels. And in the main function, we can ask a user for a letter, then by using this function we can tell him if it's a vowel or not. Here are examples. Now let's create a function that doubles a number. So what's gonna happen here? We will modify the original value. So what do we have to do? Yes, pass by reference. We must give the address. Let's start. The function returns nothing, so it's void here. Then let's name the function double number, for example. In the parameters, we said that we need the address, so it will be a pointer. And inside, we just multiply the parameters by two like this. And if we call this function from the main, you can see that the variable's value got modified. Now let's create a function that swap the value of a and b. So the value of a becomes the value of b, and the value of b becomes the value of a. We're gonna change the original value, so we need to pass by reference. The function will return nothing, so we write void. Let's name it swap. And for the parameters, we need the pointers a and b. Now let's see the instructions. As I told you in the beginning of the course, one of the ways to swap two values is to use a temporary variable to store the value of the first number to be able to use it later. And yes, you can declare variables in a function. They will be deleted from the memory when the function ends. So let's declare a temporary variable where we will store the actual value of a. Then we assign the value of b to a, then we assign the value of the temporary variable to b. And now we swap the value of a and b. Let's verify it by calling the function. Let's choose a is equal to 10 and b is equal to 20. Now we call the function, and now if we print the values of a and b before and after the function, you can see that we swapped them. Next function, we're gonna make a function that returns the maximum between two integers a and b. The function is of type integer because we will return an integer. Let's name the function max. In parameters, we need the two integers a and b. We don't want to modify the values, so we will pass them by value. And inside, we use a condition. If a is bigger than b, we return a, else we return b. By this function, I wanted to let you know that we can use multiple return statements in a function, but only one of them will be executed. Note that we could use the ternary operator. Next function, let's create a function that prints all the numbers from 1 to a given limit. First, it's of type void. Let's name it print numbers. In parameters, we need the limit which is an integer. And in the function, first we check if the limit is smaller than 1. If it's the case, we directly put the return statement to exit the function. Now in the case the limit isn't smaller than 1, we use a for loop where i goes from 1 to limit. And inside, we just print the number with a backline after it. And we got our function. Note that you're not obliged to set a return statement in a void function. Now let's call the function from the main. If we choose for example 10 as a limit, it will print all integers from 1 to 10. If we choose minus 5, it will directly exit because minus 5 is smaller than 1. So we get nothing printed. Next function we will create a function that prints the positive dividers of a positive integer. For that, we need a void function. Let's name it print dividers. In parameters we need the number. And inside, if that number is negative, we directly return to exit the function. Now if we pass that condition, we print 1, because 1 is a divider of every integer. Then we need a for loop that goes from 2, not 1 because we already printed it, to number divided by 2. We don't have to go until n, because the biggest possible divider of n except itself is n divided by 2. So we stop there. And we set a condition. If number mod i is 0, we print i because it means that i is a divider of our number. Then after the loop, we print our number himself because every integer is a divider of itself. 
but we verify before that the number isn't 1 because if it's the case, we would print 1 twice. And we got our function. And now let's use it in our next function which is a function that prints the dividers of every number from 1 to limit. It's a void function. Let's name it print dividers range. In parameters we need the limit. Inside we set the condition that if limit is smaller than 1, we directly exit. After it we need a for loop where i goes from 1 to limit. And inside each iteration, we call the function we made that prints dividers of a number. So each time we will print the dividers of i and we put a line break at the end of each iteration. Let's call this function in the main with 16 as a limit. And here is the result. We got the dividers of each number from 1 to 16. So that was our last function. I think you understood the concept of a function how and how does it work. But you have to practice a lot on them because they play an important role in programming. You'll find the source code of all functions we've seen in this description. Let's move to the next video to talk about the built-in functions. Welcome to the last video of this chapter where we will talk about the built-in functions. You have to know that there is functions that are available in libraries so you can directly use them without redefining them by including that library in your program, as we did for printf and scanf. I told you that printf and scanf are two functions that are available in the input-output library that we are including in the beginning of every program. But there is a lot of other lib libraries that contain a lot of useful functions. For example, type.h, which contains functions that are related to time controlling, or math.h, which contains functions that are related to math. We also have libraries made by people that you can find on the internet. You can also make your own library with all the functions you need. So just to tell you that in programming, you should search for a built-in function for your task instead of always reinventing the wheel. So that was the last video in this chapter. I hope you understood well. Don't forget to practice on functions a lot. Create a lot of functions and try them and see the result. You can always ask me in private message. See you in the next chapter to talk about arrays. New chapter, arrays. Okay, let's suppose you want to solve the age of two persons. You'd have to declare two variables named age person 1 and age person 2 for example. But what if you had 10 persons or 100 persons? Would you declare 100 variables? It's really exhausting and inefficient. This is why we can use a data structure named array. What is an array? An array in C language is a data structure where we can store multiple elements of the same type. For example, as we said earlier, we may want to store the age of 10 persons. So we need an array of 10 elements where the first element represents the age of the first person, the second element is the age of the second person, and so on. There is some things you need to know about arrays. First that an array in C must have elements of the same type. You can't put an integer and a character in the same array. Second thing, you have to know that elements of an array occupy successive addresses in the memory. For example, we have an array of 5 integers, we said that the size of a variable of n type in a 64 machine is 4 bytes, so if the first element is in the address 10,000, the second one will be in 10,004, the next one will be in 10,008, and so on. Third thing you have to know is that each element in an array has an index, and that we start counting from 0. Remember this. So the first element will have the index 0, the second element will have the index 1, the third element will have the index 2, and so on, for other elements. So for example, if we have an array of 5 elements, their indexes will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, respectively. In the next video, we will learn how to declare and initialize an array and how to access to its elements. See you in the next video. Welcome to this video where we will learn how to declare and initialize an array. First, let's declare an array. The syntax is very simple. First, we have the data type that will be in the array for example int or char or any other data type, then the name of the array, it follows the same rules as variable naming. Then just after it between brackets, you put the number of elements of your array. So for example, if we want to declare an array of five elements of type int, we write int, you can choose the name array, so we write array, then just after it we put the number five between brackets, because we want to have exactly five elements. In recent C languages versions, you can put a variable as the side of the array. For example, we could write this. 
So that was the first method to declare an array. We declared an array without initializing its elements. So we didn't set the values that will be in the array. So we have a second way to declare an array. It's by initializing its elements. It's the same thing at the beginning. We have the data type, the array name, the size, and then we can initialize elements by putting the elements in curly brackets separated by commas. For example, we can declare an array of four integers and we can put one, two, three, four, for example. So we write int, then the name, r, for example, then the size, the number of elements, then one, two, three, four separated by commas inside curly brackets. Note that you're not obliged to set the size of the array when you initialize its elements. For example, in our last example, we could avoid writing the size. The program would declare an array large enough to hold all the values you initialize here. But don't remove brackets, let them empty, otherwise you would get an error. Last thing before moving to examples, you have to know that to access an element in an array, you have to write the name of the array and just have to read the index of the element you want to access, between brackets, obviously. And as I said in the previous video, we start counting from zero. So the index of the first element will be zero, the index of the second one will be one, and so on. For example, if we want to print the first element of our last array, we would write this. And when we compile, we get one, which is the value of the first element. Let's do an example. Let's take again the first example we've talked about in the first video. We can make an array where we store the ages of, for example, 10 persons. So we write int ages. We're gonna initialize the array so we're not obliged to set the size, we just write the brackets. And now let's put the ages randomly. Now that we've set the values, we can access the one we want. For example, if we want to get the age of the first person, we write ages and zero between brackets. If we want to get the age of the fifth person, we write ages and four between brackets because we start from zero, so the fifth element will have the index four. In the next video, we will learn how to manipulate an array, how to fill it from the user, how to iterate over it, how to modify its elements, and many other things. See you there. Welcome to this video where we will see the main manipulations on an array. Let's start with the sum. Let's create a function named ArraySum of type int because we will return an integer. In parameters, we need the array and its size. First, if the array has no elements, we return null because we have no sum at all. Now we need a variable that we will name sum and initialize on zero. Don't forget to initialize it. Then we need the for loop. And inside, in each iteration, we will add that element to the sum. And at the end, we will return our sum. And now we make the function that returns the product of array elements. Let's name it array prod. For example, we need the array and its size. Then if the array has no elements, we return null. And here we need a variable named product, but we have to initialize it on one. Because if we initialize it to zero, we will get zero at the end because zero multiplied by any number gives zero. And in the for loop, we multiply each time product by the element of index i. And we can add this condition. If product is equal to zero, we directly return zero. Because if product became zero at a moment, it's useless to continue multiplying because we will get zero anyway. And at the end, we return the product, obviously. Third function, we will see how to get the minimum of an array. For that, we need a function of type int. So what's the logic behind finding the minimum? We will first suppose that the first element is the minimum, and then we will check in the remaining elements in order to find a smaller number. That will be the new minimum. So let's begin. First, if there is no element, we return null. Then we need a variable min that we initialize on the first element of the array, which is array of zero. And now we make a for loop where i starts at 1 and not 0 because we want to check the remaining elements. And inside we need a condition. If r of i is smaller than the actual min, it becomes the minimum. Because each time we search for a smaller number than the actual one. And at the end we return the minimum we found. Let's do the same thing for the maximum. The maximum is the biggest value of the array. So we follow the same logic as for the minimum and we do some modifications. So we change the name of the function and the variable. And here, we're searching for a bigger number. So we change the operator. And we got our function. 
Last function we're gonna see is a boolean function that verifies if a given value exists in the array or not. The boolean data type isn't initially available in C, so as I told you, we need to include the acidbool header to be able to use boolean. And now let's make the function. The function will return true or false, so it's of type bool. And in the parameters we need the array, its size, and the searched value. And inside, we first treat the case where the array has no elements, we directly return false. And now, we need a for loop where we will compare each element of the array with the search value. And if we find an element that is equal to the search value, we directly return true. And the function will stop, because we found it. And at the end, if we compared all elements and we didn't find the search value, we just return false. It means that we didn't find it. Now let's try our functions in a program. In the main function, let's declare and initialize an array. We can, for example, decide to search for the value tree. Now we create a variable for each function call. One for the sum, one for the product, one for the minimum, one for the maximum. Now let's print the results of these functions. And if we compile, you can see that we got the sum, the product, the minimum, the maximum, and that the value 3 exists in the array. You have to know that these functions aren't the only ones to manipulate an array. You can create any function depending on the situation. You can for example count the number of even values in the array, or verify that all values are positive, for example. Before moving to the next video, check the description where I will put a link to source code of the functions we've seen here. See you in the next video to talk about bidimensional arrays, also known as matrices. Welcome to this video where we will learn how to manipulate an array. In the previous video, we've seen only one way to set arrays elements values, by initializing it. But we can also for example let the user fill the array. For that, we generally use a for loop. And for the size, we can set a specific size or we can ask the user for that. Let's choose the second way now. First, we will ask the user for how many numbers he wants to put in the array. For that, we use a variable that we can name array size and we scan. But we have to make sure that user gives a positive size. So we use a do while loop that will scan while the size is negative or out of the value range. Now we declare an array with that size. And now we use a for loop to scan each element. So we use the variable i as an iterator, and in each iteration we scan the value of the ith element. So i starts as 0 because we count from 0, and inside we put scanf array of i. So in the first iteration i will be 0, so we will get the first element, then i becomes 1, and we get second element, and so on. Let's try this. Let's choose 6 as the size. And now we give the values, first value, second value, third one, fourth one, fifth one, and sixth one. Here we gave six values as we decided to do. Now that we filled the array, we want to make useful things with it. We can do a lot of things, but the main thing to know is that we can iterate over its elements using a loop. And in this loop, we can print the values, we can modify them, we can count the average, we can get the minimum, the maximum, we can do whatever we want with those elements. But first, let's see how to iterate over the array. To iterate over an array, we use the for loop where i goes from 0 to array size minus 1. And inside the loop, array of i represents the element in the array with the index i. Most basic thing we can do is to print all array values. Let's do it as a function to be able to use it again later. The type is void, because we won't return anything, we will just print. So in parameters, we need the array itself, so we need its address, and for that we need a pointer. We didn't see pointers yet, but a pointer is a variable that holds the address of another variable. So to pass an array of integers as a parameter to a function, we can write this. We could do it with any other primitive data type. And we also need its size. And inside, if the array has no elements, we directly exit. Then we create a for loop that goes from 0 to size minus 1. And we just print the element with i as index, followed by a space to have a nice display. Now that we got the function ready, let's try it. Let's first declare an array of 5 elements for example. Now we call the function. If we compile, you can see that we get the values printed. 
This one was the first example. We can also modify the values. We can decide for example to add 1 to all values and print them to see the result. So we create a function named increment all of type void, same parameters, and inside we keep the same loop. We just replace print by this instruction, array of i++, to increment the value. And if we call the function with the previous example and we compile, you can see that values got modified. We can also decide for example to set all elements to 0, so you can basically modify each element as you want. In the next video we will learn how to get the main information from an array, how to get the minimum, the maximum, the sum, the product, and how to verify if a given value exists in the array. But before that, let me just show you how to get the number of elements of an array. We will just divide the size of the array in bytes by the size of the first element in bytes, and we get the number of elements. See you in the next video.